I got this Oliver 88 table saw over 10 years ago, and it's just been sitting for the most part. I haven't used it a whole lot. I got it at an online auction in Seattle. I remember it going for really cheap, it's like $175, but it didn't come with anything. It has no fence, no miter gauges. It doesn't even have a side table. <laughs> So it was one of the first things in the shop. And I remember I built a cart for it and I used it as a platform to put up the plywood on the walls of the shop. I discovered after setting it up that there was a slight wobble to the blade. My first thought was that the arbor was bent, which seemed kind of catastrophic. And after it had sat for a few years, I saw a video from Matthias where he fixed his table saw that had a slight wobble to the blade by grinding down the arbor plate, I guess it's called, which made me wonder if that's what was wrong with my saw. There wasn't so much that the arbor was bent, which would be a much harder problem to fix. So I tested the arbor plate on the Oliver and it looked like it was about five one thousandths of an inch off. So I thought I would give Matthias's method a try. And the idea is to use the table saw almost like it's a lathe, then hold a grinding stone on that arbor plate to flatten it as the table saw is spinning. So I found a big chunk of oak and I could use this to hold the grinding stone up against the arbor plate. So I jointed two of the faces and then I planed two of the faces. And this is before I put the new planer head in. So it sounds like the old straight knife planer. And I got the tabletop clean to where the piece of oak would sit nice and flat on the table. I got a nice new grinding stone and I tried my hand at grinding down the arbor plate. And it kind of worked. I mean, it gave me some sparks, but it didn't feel like it was taking off very much and it was leaving grooves in the plate as the grinding stone isn't moving, so you're getting the same pattern across the, the surface of the plate. And I tried a finer grinding stone, and that didn't really work any better. <laughs> and it didn't smooth out what I had done with the first stone. So I poked around online looking at what other people might have done to solve this. And somewhere I saw where someone put a grinding stone on a router and then routed, sort of flush trimmed the arbor plate. So both the table saw and the router are on and this gives more of a random pattern to the grit of the stone. This seemed like it might work better. What I needed to do to make this work is to make a new plate for the router that will span the throat of the table saw. So I cut a rectangular piece of plywood and mounted that to the router, which was just a matter of making a hole for the center and holes for the screws that hold this onto the router. It took some digging to find a grinding stone bit that would fit the router and be long enough to reach down to the arbor plate on the table saw. But this seemed to work much better. It actually seemed to remove a little bit of material and it gave a better surface on the arbor plate. And I managed to get it down to about a thousandth of an inch. And when putting the blade in place, it seemed to run a lot truer as well. The other big project that I wanted to do with this saw was to move it closer to the smaller Powermatic saw to make it the side table for the Powermatic. So the plywood side table for the Powermatic would go away. I had wanted to build cabinetry in this space a long time ago, which I never got to. <laughs> I had to clean out all the stuff I had been storing in that space and clean up all the sawdust that had accumulated between the two saws. There was a whole bunch of sawdust under the Powermatic. Then I need to get the side table off, which means taking the fence of the Powermatic off. 
The rail for the fence is super simple. It's just a tube and an angle. And the tube and the angle are attached with some bolts. And the bolts are threaded into the tube. So I can take those out and then the tube comes off. Then I thought maybe I should take the other side of the table saw apart before I take the angle off as it's holding up the side table. So I have a center infill piece that needs to come out and I'm gonna to need to remake this piece once the saws are moved around as the shape of that infill piece is gonna change. I remembered I had a bunch of electrical stuff under the side table and I made sure all the power was off and I could take those boxes down. Now I can take the rail off the front of the table saw. And the bolts on the other side are off, so I just have to pull the side table out. And it's just a simple plywood frame with two legs. <laughs> so I'm not really sure what I'm going to do with this side table. I can get my crane into place to move the Oliver table saw and it just fit around the other saws. And I was hoping I could get it into a position where the, the lift mechanism is over the table saw. <laughs> In the past, I wrapped the orange chain around the saw to lift it. But I think what I'm gonna do is use lifting straps to hold the table and I'll thread the orange chain through the lifting straps and make a loop or sort of a, a ring with the orange chain that'll hold the lifting straps and provide a place to lift with the hook from the hoist. And this should protect the table saw and lift it gently and allow it to have a secure connection between the hoist and the weight of the saw. I've gotten a scale too recently and I was curious as to how heavy this saw was and it got up to 1,545 pounds, I think. I didn't want to lift it too high as I was going to hopefully move it with the crane. I didn't want to have to put it on a cart and move it the few feet that it needs to be moved and then lift it back off the cart. So I would lift it, I'd move it a little bit, and it would hit something. So the dust collection on the back was hitting something. I'm not sure what it was hitting. Put it back down, lift it up, it would hit something else. Put it, put it back down, lift it up. <laughs> it was just doing that over and over again. It felt a little bit like when they moved the space shuttle through Los Angeles really, really slowly a few years back where it was a huge object. It was doable to move it through the city, but it was just so slow because every tree and every telephone pole and every traffic light had to be maneuvered around or moved. <laughs> and that's what this felt like as I was in a somewhat tight space trying to move a very heavy object. But in the end, it worked. What was useful was to lift it where it wasn't quite completely in the air, where one corner was still sort of on the ground, and then it was light enough that I could push it. But because it was still sort of on the ground, it would stay. It wouldn't swing back to where it was before. Once I had it really close, I wanted to make some new wooden pads for it to sit on. It was slightly too low compared to the Powermatic. That was one reason. I think when I first put it in, I just used some scrap pieces of plywood. I thought it'd be nice to make something a little harder, a little nicer. So I put an oak piece at each corner. It looks like the saw sits on four corners as the, the centers of the bottom are, are concaved up. And that's where it's going to sit, because I can't move it without the crane. <laughs> and that's the height of all the other saws, too, because they're all going to have to match that. I had measured the difference between the Paramatic and the Oliver, and I had thought I had made my new oak pads the right thickness. But once I had the Paramatic in place, it was slightly too low, I think. 
I was able to move the paramatic into position and I made the new oak pads for the paramatic. I was finding it really difficult to lift the saw, which I could do, lift one side of it and put the pad underneath. But it's really hard to lift it and then move the pad into position with your foot that needs to be holding up the saw. You can see how much lower it is. And it's not a huge deal, but if I'm gonna move the fence between the two saws, it'd be nice if it didn't catch on that edge between the two saws. I tried using a stick of oak to sort of hold the saw up while I moved the pad. And that kind of worked, but it still wasn't the best. I finally just gave in and moved the crane into position <laughs> and lifted the saw with the crane. What was a little bit weird was I measured the Powermatic being about an eighth of an inch too low. So I made some spacers that were about an eighth of an inch thicker than what I had under the Powermatic before. And then the saw was an eighth of an inch too high. So I don't know where I gained an eighth of an inch. So I planed down the pieces an eighth of an inch and then it was an eighth of an inch too low again. <laughs> So I ended up gluing another piece onto the two pads that I had made, or the spacers, and replaning those down carefully. And I, I did finally get it close enough. Then I could put the fence on the front of the two saws. I have holes for the paramatic side because that's where it was, but I needed to figure out how to attach it to the Oliver. I put it in place just to see what it was going to look like. And I took it off. I do have two holes in the front of the Oliver, but they didn't go all the way through. I found a drill that was about the size of those holes. And it turned out, I'm not sure if they were just full of old sawdust or gunk of some sort, but they drilled through pretty easily. And I cleaned off the paint off the front and got the front as, as smooth as I could. Then I put the fence angle in place and I marked where those holes were on the fence or the fence rail, I guess. I put some divots in the steel where I was going to need to drill the holes. And I could take this into my metal drill press and I could drill those two holes. It's steel, but it's still drilled pretty easily. I guess it's mild steel, so it's not too hard. Then I had to put a countersink on the inside of the angle, and I just used a bigger drill bit. I think the first one I used didn't cut very well, and then I found a, another one, and that, that worked better. I think it was just sharper. Then I can put the fence rail back on again, and my holes were in the right place. It's a bolt with a nut on the back. I didn't have to thread anything. I can put the tube in place. I thought about moving it down, but then the ruler would be out of sync. It turned out I, I really didn't need to. It, it was long enough to reach to the end of the Oliver table saw. You can put the blade back in and the throat plate. I did check for the parallelness of the two blades from the two table saws, I realized what I might have to do is have two fences each adjusted to each table saw. But it looks like the two blades are actually very parallel to each other. So I think I can get away with one fence. I can finally get to the third table saw. This is a Powermatic 72. I got this at an auction in Seattle as well. <laughs> I needed to take the fence and the rail off, and the side table needed to come off so I could lift it to get it into place. I was trying to move this by hand too, and, and this saw is heavier. So it turned out the Oliver is 1,545 pounds. The Parmatic 66, the smaller one, is 450 pounds, and the Parmatic 72 is 750 pounds. 
this one's going to move just slightly to the south, so I guess to the right side of the frame. Because of where the dust collection comes out of the floor, the whole setup had to shift that direction about four or six inches, something like that. This, I just had to make the oak pads. I think with these, I got the height right. I think I was able to measure and make it work <laughs> the first time. It's more just a matter of getting it into the right place. So this, I want the T-tracks to line up with the two table saws. And they don't have to be perfect. I found that I don't really go from one T-track to the other. There's nothing really that's that long. And with this new setup, the distance between the two paramatics is going to be a little further. So there's even less of a reason to have those lined up. The angle iron was hitting the crane, and I was, wasn't able to get the saw into the right location. So I had to take the angle off and got it mostly into place. And I put the cabinet that's next to the Powermatic 72 back. And that cabinet's going to be slightly further out now as well. So I put the fence tube, the fence rail back on, and then I remembered I've always wanted to move this down to the east. So I guess to, sort of to the left in this, this shot. As I haven't really used it on the right side of the blade as much, and I tend to need it on the left side more. But in moving it, that meant the, the first couple of screws went in and had holes in the right location. But the rail towards the other end, towards the cabinet end, the holes weren't in the right location. So I had to drill a few more holes. So these are the holes that go from the angle to the tube. And with the new holes, I can put that tube in. I need to put the side table in first, as I need to be able to get to the bolts that go through the angle into the side table box. Set the side table in, then I could shim it up to the right height off the cabinet, then bolt it in place so it's flush with the top of the table saw. I can check, make sure things are flush. It's mostly important so that as you're pushing something through any of the three saws, it doesn't get caught on something as you're sort of halfway through the cut, because that's at best annoying and at worst dangerous. <laughs> I had a very small space to get the screws into the side table, and they weren't going in as I hadn't pre-drilled holes into the plywood. So I took everything apart, <laughs> and I drilled holes into the plywood and put it all back together again. Then it worked with the screws. I suppose now that I drilled the holes, I could have used little bolts instead of the screws, and that probably would have been a little better. Then I can do the bolts on the front. And I can put the fence tube back on. The last thing I need to do is make the infill piece between the saws. And the first thing to do on that is to cut another piece of angle to go on the back of the Powermatic 66. As the Oliver's now in the way, I don't need the long piece that was on there before. And I don't want to cut that piece as that's the piece that came with the saw. And I, I would rather keep that intact. So I have this leftover piece of angle from building the original CNC machine. I need some holes to attach this to the back of the saw and to attach the infill piece that's going to sit in this space. I can attach that to the back of the saw. I'm going to cut two two by fours to a width that'll go between the angles on the backs of the saws to the bottom of the piece of plywood that'll infill this space. So they need to be the right thickness. So hopefully I've measured good. <laughs> I marked where the holes in the steel are so I can drill through the wood and bolt these pieces to the angle. So it's just a matter of putting the bolts through and tightening them up. 
on the longer section of wood, I used some washers between the angle and the piece of wood to get the piece of wood parallel with the tabletop surface. And it was just a matter of tightening those up. I have one last piece of plywood from the interior walls of the shop. And I found it while I was looking for something to make this infill piece with. And it was just wide enough. So I can cut that shape from this piece of plywood, which was just cutting it to width and then cutting out a section for the Oliver table saw. And it fits, but there's one more issue. <laughs> the angles that are attached to the backs of the saws come up higher than the thickness of the plywood. So I have to cut some rabbits out of the sides of the plywood to make some space for those angles. Once I did that, it fits in place. I wanted to round over the top of this piece as I want it just ever so slightly higher than the table saws. So any piece that I'm pushing through the saw will hit that right up and over and then not get caught on the saw on the other side. Then I can cut the slots into this piece. This is more so the end of whatever I'm using in the miter slot will have some place to go. And I have some short, wider slots for the Oliver table saw. I can do those on the radion saw. There's a little bit of difference in the width of the two paramatic saws. So I need to cut an S-curve into the end of this piece. This was the one thing I thought about doing on the CNC machine. But it was quicker to just kind of sketch it and cut it on the bandsaw and sand it on the spindle sander. And it can go into place. And I think it can just sit there. I don't think I have to screw it down or anything like that. And I found I was using the setup pretty quickly. I really like the Oliver as a ripping saw. It cuts really nice and smooth and having a direct drive saw is just really, really nice. So the, the two big things I wanted to do, which was to, to fix the Oliver and move it and make the table saw set up a little more compact. But some other things that are kind of nice that happened were the rail on the Paramatic 77, I got to move over. So I have more space for using that saw now with the fence. And the emergency stop on the Paramatic is more out in the open now. So it's a little safer. Right now the dust collection for the three saws isn't really the best. And it might be nice to figure out something better for that. Like maybe a manifold system or something. And possibly a better off switch for the Oliver. Right now you have to kind of hunt for the off button. <laughs> I also got to play around with a prototype fence called Rip It that moves into a very precise position on its own. I'll leave a link in the description for more information. Thanks for watching.